Community Action Network. And we're here in Grid City, Texas to host an informational meeting regarding the Blue Marlin Crude Oil Pipeline. The Blue Marlin Pipeline will originate in Needle, Texas and go under the sea, the Nature's River, through parts of Sabine Lake, around and through Bessie Heights Marsh in the vicinity of Grid City, Texas, and then on into Louisiana to an offshore oil port. We'd like to inform the community, as well as property owners and regular citizens, about this pipeline, how it may affect them, and also give them solutions as to how they can go about protecting their rights as property owners. So I ask you to join us here, and there are several ways you can do that. You can show up here to the community center in Bridge City, the senior citizen center, rather, and you can also tune in on Facebook Live on my Facebook page, and you can also go to, if you want to see a live broadcast of this, to the YouTube page of LD Ray. So once again, thank you. Come on down and get some information about this blue ball and pipeline. Companies 
that made over $2.4 billion during that time was sent into transfer funds. While most of Texas saw that 250 Texans died close to death, Energy Transfer Partners, which is headed up by billionaire Kelsey Walker, made $2.4 billion while we saw, while many of our friends and others saw. So once again, this company is not showing a lot of responsibility or accountability for what they do. And we can't trust the state really. The Texas Railroad Commission oversees pipelines, and they don't do a very good job. Matter of fact, there was a pipeline leaked by the same company about two months ago, just north of us here. How many of you heard about that? We just happened to hear about it, but we took that information to give to local TV and radio stations and say, hey, can you let people know about this? Not me. Not the word was said. So, once again, we're not here this evening to scare anybody or tell you what to do or how to think, but we're here to offer our services through the members that make up this same Lake Sabine coalition. And those members are my organization, Port Arthur Community Action Network, PRPC, or the Property Rights and Pipeline Center, Earthworks, Healthy Gulf, and also TCE, the Texas Commission for the Environment. These are all concerned organizations that look at things that happen in Texas and try to work to help inform citizens and give them options. The Property Rights and Pipeline Center is here because as a landowner, you need to know your rights because if they put this pipeline in, they can basically take your property for little or nothing. It's called eminent domain. And all they have to do is show a public need and purpose, and they give you pennies on the dollar. And you can either take it, or they'll go to your neighbor and pay them, and take you to court and run it anyway. And so we have people here that talk to you more about that, and we'll also give you more information on how to do this. So once again, thank you for coming this evening, and we're going to get into, I guess you say, into our show, the slideshow here. So I want to give you a few facts, starting with slide four, with regard to the Blue Marlin Project. Excuse me, it's a little hard to see. Okay. Once again, this is a 42-inch pipeline. It's going to run 37 miles just in Texas alone. I found what it's going to do in Louisiana and offshore. Over 2 million barrels of oil per day will go through that pipeline. A barrel of oil, if you didn't know, is 42 gallons. So that's 42 million gallons a day. Really, no, not 42. It's actually 84 million gallons. 2 million gallons times 42 is what you get. So that's over 80 million gallons of oil is going to go through that pipeline every single day, 365 days a year. Also, this pipeline will go through parts of New York, Bridge City, Bessie Heights Marsh, Sabine Lake, the Sabine National Wildlife Refuge, and then on into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the amount of oil that this pipeline will transfer is more oil than a year that is produced in the whole Gulf of Mexico in 2019. And the dredging and the risk of oil spills in Sabine Lake, Betsy Heights Marsh will affect clam and oyster beds. It will also affect recreation. And we all know that a lot of the fishing that goes on at Betsy Heights and the fishing in Lake Sabine and other waters around here comes from the marsh. The marsh is like a nursery. And if you dare to destroy that nursery with this crude oil, it's going to harm fishing and recreation, but more so a lot of people make their living fishing in Lake Sabine and fishing these waters. And that's going to be affected. And no one knows just how much that's going to be. We'll be able to show you later, but this, this graphic you see of Lake Sabine and all is a study that they that was requested by the company to do energy transfer. The government wanted to know, if you have a spill, how bad would it be? All of that darker area you see on that left side, that shows what a spill would look like, how bad it would be. And it says that it is likely that the pipeline 
was filled with people during his lifetime. That's what energy transfer said. That during his lifetime, there will be repeated spills. And it also said that, uh, thank you. <laughs> you think, if you think I'm having a hard time, I can imagine the people are saying <laughs> But I also went on to say that in the event of a major spill, in or near Sabine Lake, it will be very likely to devastate the surrounding environment and the communities. That's Port Arthur on the other side. That's Bridge City over here. And this was a risk assess assessment that Blue Marlin did with regard to the wall spill. If that wall was to be spilled over in this area, how it would come into the lake. And some of that area, not very deep, but there are oyster beds there. And, this, and, and that's where a lot of young fish and all are. Well, that would be devastating totally. You couldn't use, use or do that anymore. Matter of fact, there are three oyster beds in Lake Sabine. There are two in that area, the northern part, and toward the southern end where it outlets, there's another oyster bed. They're young, but they're, they're beginning to come back because we cleaned up the water, there's been less pollution, and they've done things to nurture that. Texas Parks and Wildlife Department has done things to make it better. But now here comes this company wants to put a pipeline and cut her off that. Energy transfer is not to be trusted. Over the last two decades, energy transfer has been among the worst operators of pipelines in the country for spills and accidents. From 2002 to 2018, energy transfer companies reported 527 incidents. 527 incidents. That amounts to, in that period of time, about one incident for one leak every 11 days. Also, these spills cost property owners around $115 million in damages and resulted in 5.7 million dollars in penalties from the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. So they were set fines and penalties, but that's just the federal fines. It's not even counting on the state and other agencies. A company whose pipeline leaks, spills, and even explosions, that pipeline there shows a 60-foot rupture where the pipeline just split open. Of energy transfer of nine counts 
of environmental crimes related to their conduct during the construction of another pipeline, the Revolution Pipeline. Energy Transfer had three incidents just in Texas in a couple of months. June 30th of this year, 2022, the pipeline, and also there's a pipeline spill in West Texas, a liquefied petroleum gas explosion and fire. You probably heard about it. It was in the news. And uh, this, this pipeline spill resulted in over 210,000 gallons of oil going into the ground. And the bad part about that is in various places that were rural and community areas out in the country, like you say, when that oil gets in the ground, it soaks through and it gets into the water table. So now people who depend on wells for drinking water, and farmers who depend on those wells for irrigation, now they don't have a clean source of drinking water. In just the last couple of months, once again, there was an explosion. There was an explosion in Fort Bend County in June, June 7th of this year. July. July 7th, I'm sorry, July 7th of this year. And the blast from that explosion could be seen and felt over 30 miles away. There was another one in Bessie Heights Marsh, where I told you about earlier, a discharge of approximately 50 barrels of crude oil into Bessie Heights Marsh. And the responsible party that they could find that was doing this had a pipeline in the vicinity where they found this leak, the old energy transfer. That was just on May 3rd of this year. Here's a quick reminder for those of you that fish. You probably know more about this than I do. I used to fish, but I don't have the patience for it anymore. I get tired after about half of the base guard, you know, the little hard edge catfish and crabs eat up everything. And next thing you know, I just take the whole box and throw it in there and all that. But anyway, you know, here's some of the fish that would be affected by that. Sea trout, draw, croaker, gulf menhaden, bass, goldfin, catfish, snapper, flounder, garfish, skipjack, crabal, kingfish, ladyfish, bumblefish, greatfish, bull sharks. Yes, we have sharks in these waters. Sheephead, triple tail, and gap topsy. Catfish. But you know, in spite of all that's being said about this pipeline, you have to ask the question, what do our communities get in return for all of this? You know, what they wanted to put this pipeline in. Well, they love to tell you about the jobs they're going to create. Want to know, or anybody want to take a guess how many jobs this is going to create this project? Eleven. And most of those jobs are not going to be here in Orange County or Jefferson. The pipeline can take your land against your will and have a permanent easement on your property. And that's why the property rights and pipeline center is here to talk to you about that. But also, but also there's the real risk of spills and explosions. And they make billions of dollars in profit, but only want to give you pennies to basically use your land almost free of charge. According to Blue Marlin's permit, there will be 11 permanent positions. But here's the other thing, you know, that's the construction part of it too. You know, you're gonna need welders, you're gonna need guys on back holes and track holes and whatever to dig the trench out and to lay the pipeline. Well, energy transfer has already figured out how they're gonna get Southeast Texas out of that. You know how? According to this, their own estimates, over 85%, 80 to 85% of the workers are going to come from outside the area. So our local people won't even get a share of that action to make a living for their families. Welders or journeyman welders, they won't get any work. Pipe fitters, they won't see any of that. They're bringing people in. When they bring people in, that means your people don't get the opportunity. We don't get those opportunities. It's not good for Southeast Texas. So what we want to be able to do is to provide you a means to take action. And one of the things you can do is to spread the word Talk to your friends and neighbors about this, and on the table next to you, you will see, and on the screen here, this QR code. And if you take your phone and put it on camera setting and seize this code, then you can click on that, and it will take you to our website, Saves for Being Late. That will be you to the map. That will be you to the interactive map. Thank you. I'm sorry. This, this is the key to the map. An interactive map that will show you that you can look at and see where you live in relationship to where this pipeline is going to go and whose property is going to be affected. So if you will, have a moment. Take your, your Okay. We'll use the one 
on the screen. You take your phones out and focus it on the screen right there. I'll step back out of the way. You'll be able to go to that site and see it. And we ask that you share that with your friends and neighbors. We'll put out some other information for you to share with them all. And also, when you go to our Facebook page on this, please like us. So that way we get more likes and get more opportunities for us to share this with other people. Once again, we're talking about property owner rights to deal with this pipeline. And the pipeline company can use your land against your will using a device they call eminent domain. And pipelines by the state of Texas as well as the federal government are given eminent domain rights. A company has the right to file a form with the Texas Railroad Commission declaring that they are a common carrier by just checking a box on a piece of paper. Just simple piece of paper that they have saying, we're putting this pipeline in because we're a common carrier and it's in the public needs and necessity. It's going to help the public if we do this. And most of the time, the state just says, oh, oh really? That's what you're going to do? Okay. Try and see it. Oh, it's going to pipeline. And don't take into consideration the impact it's going to have on the environment and on people. And also, they use something to decide how much they're going to pay you called just compensation. Who decides what is just compensation? You know, the, the landowner's bill of rights for the state of Texas says you must be properly compensated. You must receive just compensation. You're entitled to receive fair market value, which is the highest and, for the highest and best use of your land to which the property could be used for. You, you also must be provided with the landowner's bill of rights or copy of it. And any entity exercising eminent domain must provide you with a copy. So here's a bit of advice. If you approach or live along this pipeline of you, there's a saying you have lawyer up, get some help, get some information. Don't trust to the company to tell you, because they're working for the interests of that company, not for you. You get your own lawyer representation who has experience in property rights and pipelines. You have to protect yourself and you better be able to, if you wanted to, commit to that part of your property or run that pipeline there to defend yourself. Once again, we're not here to tell you to do it or not to do it, to give you information. And all, one of the things we will tell you, though, is if you are in an offer, don't accept the first offer. Everybody knows pretty much the first offer is usually the worst. You have to negotiate, and you have to negotiate the best price for your property. And also, do not sign any easement agreements for land use to run it near or close to your property, because it's going to affect your property value. Also, Texas A&M has a site, the Texas Pipeline Easement Negotiation Checklist. And you can go to that. As a matter of fact, we have the listing for it. You can go on your computer and look that up and get the information for yourself. The better you know about your rights, the better you're able to protect yourself and your interests. Here's the thing you have to realize when you deal with these companies, and this is really important. You have to know or know how to negotiate with that company's lawyers. And usually lawyers, as we all know, they use language that sometimes we don't understand. So it's good to have your own lawyer to help you do that. Also, how do you calculate your land's highest and best use? You're going to need some help with that. And you also have to decide and find out, will you be compensated fairly? Or will you be taken advantage of? You go into this without a lawyer, you're just trying to do it by yourself. It's quite likely that you're going to get taken advantage of. In Port Arthur, I served on the city council for nine years. And we had a pipeline company that came in and wanted to run a pipeline by some folks' homes. Really under their homes. And they were often in the very low four figures. I'm talking about less than $10,000 to run it. And that's for all time. That's as long as they're going to run it. But every day, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars go through that pipeline. And all you're going to get is just a one-time check. That's not right. That takes away the use and advantage of the property. And also, if that pipeline should fail, have a legal rupture, you're going to be affected. We've seen times when people have that happen and see it on TV. Farmland has been disrupted, homes have been damaged or destroyed. That's not good. That's not fair and just compensation. 
So what can you do? First of all, find a lawyer who will represent you, and you can go to the pipelinecenter.org on your computer for that information. They have a list of attorneys that will help you. Also, you can see the landowner's guide to fighting pipelines at pipelinecenter.org's website. You can also be connected to, eminent, to other eminent domain threatened landowners. In other words, if you've got friends and neighbors and they run into that pipeline by the boat, you need to come together and try to find a way to get it work together. Sometimes they may want to do it, other person may not. But it's up to you to find representation and be better equipped to handle this by getting a lawyer. Also, consider forming an easement action team. And the Pipeline Center can also help you with that, tell you what you need to do to protect your rights. Also, you can offer to speak to a news reporter or TV reporter or be quoted in a press release regarding this pipeline. Because just like we did here, you probably saw the ad you had on TV or you read about it in the paper or you heard about it in some way. Well, we did that for a reason, and that's to get people to come out so we can talk to them and help them be better informed. Because the company's not going to do that. They don't have any obligation to do any sort of thing like that to tell you what they want to do. So we're here to try to help them. That's, that's part of what we do. Are there any questions? Yes. They, they own that now. I didn't know they owned that too recently when I go about them. They used to be old XR Mobiles, you know, sorry. But they own quite a few pipelines. And one of the things I learned again when I was on city council, from, uh, well, before I was on city council, was that you always hear them say, call before you dig. You know, whether you're digging in your own yard or you're, you know, clearing property or whatever. Because you don't know what's on the ground. You know, one of the neighborhoods not far from me, they were built, putting a recovery home in place. And they had to drill, you know, put the pilings in, because they had to raise the house up off the ground. You know, that's what FEMA does now. If you're in a flood area, the house has got to be built up off the ground. They don't want you to get flooded here. And in the course of digging those pilot holes, that's what they hit. Or, all started cleaning them out of the ground. And this is in a neighborhood where people have lived, I'm 60 some years old, and people have always lived there. And that's the first time I hear about it. But unfortunately, less than a half mile away from they were building a home, they did the same thing. So, you don't know what's underneath. You don't know what these companies did years ago. And when they get ready to move on or do something different, they'll ban them from pipelines. They may clean them out a little bit, or they may have them one in, back on the other. And that's it, and they forget about it. And if people forget over time, grass and trees grow around, you don't know what's there. So it's important to call before you need to know what's underneath before you buy a man. Know the history of it. Find out about it, because you just don't know. But there are a lot of pipelines all over this area. I wish we had a map we could show you of all the gas lines that come in through here, through that lake. There are over 8 to 10 lines already in Lake City. And a few years ago, I remember one that was crossing under a canal in Port Arthur on Highway 73 blew out. It was blowing water straight up in the air, you know, such things. And less than two miles from that, a gas pipeline blew out. And there was a fire. It took them about, what, six, eight days before that pipeline stopped burning because the valves were 50 miles away on each end. And it was only a six inch line. So it took all that time for that gas to burn off. But that's not good either, because you know what that gets, that fumes, and those fumes are good. I know of one line that's touched across the thing here in Orange. One control station is over by uh, Old Cross Light. Mm -hmm. The other side of on it was on the other side of uh, Hackberry. Yep. They shut that down and burned it off. We were going to burn off for seven days around the clock. Somebody, three different locations and one some flow charts around the clock. We weren't very happy when we got to the burn off. No. We changed over to the new line. And some of that line wasn't that far underground. It was that. Put it in 68 days and a lot of well, instead of welding with stick rod or big guns like they do now, it was gas welding. Tell you how old it was. No, nothing yet. Part of my background is I worked in petrochemical for Exxon Mobil and we dealt with pipelines a lot with that too. And 
hand. It's very troublesome that those companies aren't being watched and monitored when they put these together and they're not welded properly and well unexpected or the metal is cheap. You know, they, they tell you they're going to use one thing, but they're going to find out, man, we can save a dollar, we can save a dollar a foot, go around something else. Well, we got 12 hours of pipeline, save a dollar a foot. Companies will go for it. And that pipeline may not be, the pipe is made out of metal itself, may not be any good or may not even be suitable for that use. Yes, sir. First of all, I didn't know anything about this until the article I read it in the That's a shame this should be going on. The public didn't know anything about it. Sure. But in the record, it mentions about an old pipeline they're going to tie into as a gas and as soon as it liquid it's vapor out of it. Sure. So, and so my question is, when was the last time that line was inspected? Still in service. Still in service? It's still in service. I know the pipelines. Is that the one that's uh that means Johnson in Hollywood? Yeah, man. Maybe Johnson Bay is in Right. And it's sitting basically on on the ground on the beach, right? No, no, no. They did have some erosion at the beach, but they come back and forward it since. I grew up in that part of the country, so uh, I don't know. Yeah. Any idea how old the pipeline is? The pipeline was probably put in in 
They're not obligated to keep the wall here in that city. And why would they when they can sell it for so much more overseas? I know I say it's all about the money, but really it's all about the money. They make more money on that day oil selling it overseas than they do drilling for it here. And if you don't know about drilling, but you see them out there somewhere and they have these drilling rigs on land, it costs a million dollars a day just to drill a hole. And guess what? You may not find no oil. It may be a dry hole. And you have to buy it and you pay for China. Not in Europe, how their problems are Right. 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 And then, too, uh, because you have the pipeline in and the lack of maintenance and the danger to it increase, now you're going to put people in risk and the community in which they live and the marshes and estuaries that some of us depend on. And it's just not a good idea. There's a, you know, there's another way to do it. We can, but to tell the truth, and that's another story, we're going to have to find a way to, to do better with oil and gas. Because oil and gas, the reason why it's been so hot lately, the reason why we had these freezes, the sea levels rising and all of that, what you believe it or not, it, it, it is changing. I, in a lot short time being here, I can, I can see some of the changes. We've got um, lawyer Chris Jones calling in. Yes. Yeah, we have one of the lawyers for PR. Yeah. Before we get to that guy, I think he's still this question. He has his hand up. Go ahead. You're talking about platinum. You know how many platinum believers with refineries in the report on alone and go to the North Peak? We can cripple New York State. Yeah. Just a Gulf of London, probably 200 pipelines leaving that plane going out here to West Point off the road. You don't hear leaks about those. No. They have leaks, but you don't hear it. No, you don't. Same place in the refinery. We had leaks. No one, it wasn't on the news. But if you're wanting to make this pipeline news, there's pipelines everywhere. So you go out there in the marsh, right here, best you have the marsh now, there's probably 25 plants running through there. One, one incident. That's all it takes. I'm 71 years old. One incident in 70 years. How many times do you plan to catch on fire? Yeah. Well, just think about the one in Fort Bay, the TDC. Yeah. They found part of the debris from that. I read, I heard about way over here. I see it. Yes. And I heard it. I was at home that night. And I was looking at Channel 6 News, and Moscow was saying, hey, it's, you know, we're going to have rain about 2, 3 o'clock that morning, and all of a sudden I hear this rumble, and it rumbled and rumbled on, and I said, uh, that ain't thunder. <laughs> that ain't thunder. And I got out and went to look around, and I lived in over the refineries, and happened to see that, and then someone called me and said, hey, they had a big explosion in Fort Bates, come across the overpass near uh, Memorial in 73, and there it was. And people still trying to put their lives back together. Yep. Like I said, don't take it one time. Go ahead, we're going to have uh, the lawyers, one of the lawyers from uh, East Yeah. 
usually in collaboration with others, be able to shut down the pipeline, either through arguing that it isn't a, a true public use because it's the, 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 the products that are ultimately going to be sold off are going to be sold off outside the United States. That was one, one project, and then a couple of other ones that we've been able to, to, to stop by, uh, you know, a tax on the different permits that they need to get. And so there, there are ways for communities to stop that, but I just want to put up front that it's a, it's a difficult thing to do, and you've got really very little chance of doing it unless you really work together as a community. And so I think for everybody, the first question is, am I okay with this pipeline being on my land? And if, if, if they take me that money, right? And if you are, then, you know, that's your choice, obviously, but if, 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 if the desire is not to have the pipeline on, it's one of the very first things to do is to start organizing as a, as a group of, of concerned citizens, you know, neighbors. And, you know, it's, quite, it's wonderful to have an organization like this involved to help coordinate a response among the, among the affected, uh, yeah, among the affected landowners. So that's probably all I'm going to say about ways to shut down the pipeline. Um, it, is, it is difficult. It's relatively rare to be able to get it shut down. I've been involved in multiple projects, again, where we have been successful shutting things down with even multi-billion dollar projects. And yet, um, it is difficult. And to have any chance to do it, you need to work together. So that's kind of point number one. Point number two is, um, that was a little about the human domain process. You know, if, if you're able to find yourself in Texas state court, there's going to be a kind of a two-step process. There's what's called a, a special commissioner's court, which is an administrative phase. The judge appoints three people who own property in your county, and that's their only qualification. Is that they be over 21, they be a sound mind, and they own property in your county. And they get to decide how much compensation we get for taking. If either side is unhappy, whether it's you or the pipeline company unhappy with the amount that the commission award, either side can appeal and wipes out what happened from before, and then you just go to court. And and the the typical thing to do there is to get a, an appraisal expert to support your side, because the pipeline company by law needs to give you an appraisal to support the amount that they offer you. So it, at that point, it's really what I call a battle of the expert. You know, there's the pipeline company's appraiser who says how much compensation should be paid. There's the landowner's appraiser who, you know, almost every day, is given a much different opinion. Um, I will say a few things, though, before that, before you get to court even, it's very, very common for people to just take the first offer that they get from a pipeline company. The numbers on some projects are as high as, and when I say take the first offer, maybe they negotiate 10, 15% up. But most people, according to you know, a mediator who's done a ton of these, um, a, a ton of these kind of cases, got some information from the pipeline companies themselves. And they say that about 91 to 93 percent of people just negotiate a little bit on the front end, and then they just give up their property for whatever the pipeline company's offered. And a lot of times, the pipeline company does something that might be a little tricky for people. I mean, I want to see if uh, if, if you all pick up on on this. Say you they've got a piece of land that's worth ten thousand dollars an acre. Um, just to use easy, easy, easy numbers. $10,000 an acre, and they say, hey, you got, you got 30 acres here. We're only going to take two of your acres. We will pay you $10,000 an acre, the full value of your land for the easement that we're going to take through your property. And so we'll offer you $20,000. But hey, we'll be super generous with you. We'll even offer $25,000 for the two acres we're going to take. What's wrong with that? Anybody? pick out what's wrong with, with what the pipeline company is doing there?
I hear from you in about five seconds. They use an all 30 acres. Yeah, it's the, it's the, the pipeline doesn't have an impact just on the part that's taken. The pipeline is going to have an impact on the whole value of your property of the remaining 28 acres, right? And so, you just that, that's right. And, and usually, that's where the big disagreement is between appraisers. It's hardly ever about the part that's taken. People can agree that the part that's taken is damaged, you know, 85 to 100 percent if there's a pipeline on it. But a lot of times, the pipeline companies will say, hey, the rest of your property has got zero damages on it. And we know that that just doesn't make sense. And the jury, it doesn't make sense either. Usually, you know, once it gets to a jury, a jury hears that. A lot of times, they're offended that a pipeline company would say that their taking doesn't impact the value of your remaining 28 acres. Because as soon as you got an easement across there, you lose your privacy. People can come in and inspect the line at any time. Uh, they they consider our, our restrictions on your ability to cross the pipeline with a road or a, an electric. But if you want to develop your land and put electric on the other side of, of where the pipeline is, uh, you want to put a water line, a sewer line, um, you know, anything like that, septic field, you can do that. You, you basically have the pipeline company as your development partner. So you've got that. And the reality is that people know that these things are not safe. Because if you had an opportunity to choose a piece of land with a pipeline on it versus a piece of land that didn't have a pipeline on it, which are you going to choose? Like, it's obvious if you're going to pick the one without the, the pipeline on it every day of the week, assuming that it's the same, you know, same kind of, kind of property otherwise. So it's really, really important to not let the pipeline company fool you. And it's really, you know, whether it's a dark firm or somebody else, I highly encourage you to actually help you navigate the process. Uh, and, 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 but first, you need to make a decision. Are you really going to stand up and try to stop this pipeline? And, um, you know, it, it might be that, that the court forces you to kind of go ahead with the compensation side and say, it's really important whether you're challenging the pipeline or whether you're making sure you get the best decent terms and the best uh, compensation for yourself. It's really important to have somebody help you guide and get healthy guide you through that process. So I, I, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to, to speak with you tonight. Um, I'm, I'm here in Texas. I had some hearings this week and it's quite difficult for me to make it make it uh, down to where y'all are tonight, but, um, you know, look forward to maybe talking with some of you and answering, answering your questions, whether it's tonight or some other time, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate it. Does anybody have any questions? Chris, could you, could you talk about how you get paid? How we get paid? Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. Uh, I mean, that's an important part for me, and you know, I got to be able to keep the lights on. Um, typically, how, how it works in our cases, we, um, whatever offer is on the table from the pipeline company, we didn't do anything to, to help you get that. And so what we do is we take a percentage, usually 35% of any amount that we get over and above the, the offer that's on the table from the pipeline company. And if you don't have an offer yet, then you just say, hey, we from the from the first written offer that you get from the pipeline company, that that's how we that's what we use to 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 base our fee on. So for example, if they offer you ten thousand bucks and we give you twenty thousand dollars, so again you can easy math, I would hope that we give you much more than twenty thousand dollars. You could expect that um, in most cases. Um, then we would take we didn't do anything to get the first ten thousand dollars, but we got it up to twenty, and so the increase was another ten thousand dollars. And so we would base our fee on on the percentage of the additional amount that we got here. Yeah. We're also happy to do it hourly if, if people prefer, um, but that our typical arrangement is a contingency fee arrangement. Yeah, 
questions? So I encourage everyone to get up and, you know, 
Once uh, their uh, environmental impact statement comes out, that will trigger a 30 day comment period. The Merit Administration. That's why we need your, your email or your phone number. We're going to let everybody know when that 30 day comment period starts and you'll be able to keep comment. So everyone, you know, sign up to sign up. Before, before we start, I just want to make a comment about John. Hi, I'm more shut up. I'm from Louisiana. But um, I come to John's meeting, but I just want you all to know, because he's not going to say all this about himself, but John really works hard day in, day out, year round for the Texas, uh, the Southeast Texas community, um, Port Arthur and all the surrounding areas. Next week we'll both be in D.C. Um, having a press conference ahead of the first meeting. We've invited first to come here, first is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, we've invited the president to come here to the Gulf Coast to see what we're dealing with, with all of the pipelines and the proposed project. So I want you all to know that this is not just something he decided to have a meeting tonight and the other night, but he has, he has worked up to these meetings and he really needs support of the citizens here because whenever they see the numbers of people, you know, they help us to move things. We're at the hearing, we're coming, but the more of you who show up and come in and come to the hearing about your property, your livelihood, then it helps, helps them in his fight. His organization is Pecan for the Arthur Action Network, but he fights for the whole Texas. So I just wanted to uh, let you all know that about him because he really works hard and for little or no money at all. So, uh, so thank you, thank you, John, for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.